please rise and join me in the store flag. Okay. <laughs> If you remain standing, please. Uh, as you know, I'm sure, uh, this past week, uh, this past weekend, uh, two young girls that graduated Norwalk High School in 2019 were involved in a head on collision in West Haven in 995. Um, and they uh, they succumbed to their to their injuries. Uh, also, um, we lost a local sports hero, Bobby Miller, who is brother uh, stepbrother of Calvin Murphy, uh, who passed away this weekend as well. So I'd like to just have a moment of silence in memory of all those people. Thank you. <laughs> If you please call the roll. Mr. Burnett. Present. Mr. Goldstein. Here. Mr. Lopez. Present. Ms. Najilski Eichner. Present. Ms. Smith. Here. Ms. Ayers. Present. Mr. Seed. Present. Mr. Wiggins. Here. Ms. Young. Here. Ms. McMurr. Present. Ms. Murray. Here. Ms. Dunn. Here. Mr. Sutton. Present. Mr. Frere. Here. Ms. Shanahan? Here. 15, we have a quorum. Thank you. First item on the agenda is the acceptance of the minutes of the regular meeting of February 13th, 2024. Do I have a motion? Ms. McMurr, any corrections, deletions, or omissions? I don't have to check the screen this time. I'm seeing that special meeting. I'm sorry? Next. 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 Okay. So all in favor of acceptance of the minutes as submitted. Opposed? Extensions? Extensions. Ms. Uh, Dunn is abstaining. I'm sorry, <laughs> Ms. Millis, Ms. Murray <laughs> is abstaining. Uh, next item on the agenda, approval of the minutes of the special meeting of February 13th, 2024. Uh, Ms. Young, any corrections, deletions, or omissions? Mr. Sutton. Uh, let the witness reflect that I was present at this meeting. Okay. Okay. So Mr. Sutton, the, the correction is that Mr. Sutton was in attendance. Any further corrections or deletions or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Extensions? Ms. Murray. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda is public participation. Uh, if you uh, wish to address the council, if you'll come to the podium, if you have signed the, the paper and uh, speak on any item that's on the agenda, and uh, we have a limit of three minutes. Ms. Lisa, Lisa Brinton. Everybody looks so nice this evening. It must be picture day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like school picture day. Uh, Lisa Brinton, 19 Shorefa Park. Um, I submitted my budget recommendations this morning before noon uh, for you to review and inclusion in the meeting minutes. So I'm not gonna belabor those points tonight. You can all read them. Um, what I wanted to add, um, maybe anecdotally, is I moved to Row 8 in, in 1998. And at that time, my taxes were $6,600. In 2020, when I moved, they were $23,000. Now, nobody in this room or in Norwalk is gonna cry and go boo-hoo, Lisa Britton had to move out of Row 8. And, but the point I want to make is I didn't sell my house for three and a half times what my tax bill was. Um, sadly, this tax hike isn't a surprise to me. Uh, it's why I sold and downsized when I did. But I want to say how many other Norwalkers, second or third generation, will have the privilege that I did to be able to downsize and still stay in this city? Um, when you factor in the years of rising high need students in poverty, the exclusionary zoning in our neighboring towns, and the state driven density with our abatements and our REITs, you know, to REITs and developers, as well as the ECS funding that we've been shortchanged on for two decades. The math doesn't work for residents. It just doesn't. Um, I don't know whether I, I had heard that maybe you guys were not gonna vote on the budget cap tonight, or I know you're still scrubbing the budget as much as you can. Um, hopefully you're looking to still cut consolidate and look for new revenue sources um, because this great city, this isn't just a one-year problem. This is our new reality. 
um, I just came from the Board of Ed. They're adding legal counsel, their own in-house legal counsel. I thought we were supposed to be consolidating. So that's hot off the press from about 20 minutes ago. Um, shifting gears just quickly, I just wanted to comment on the redistricting committee vote tonight and reiterate the ordinance that you vote on and for this selection process is an outlier compared to the rest of the state. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with the D my comments because I already provided those for the record. But if you vote yes, you are codifying what I consider and many consider an undemocratic and exclusionary selection process, ignoring independents, unaffiliated and Republicans, effectively saying it's our way or it's who we want or the highway. Um, therefore, the independent party has no other option but to file a complaint with the state. They probably won't care either. Um, but without healthy and genuine opposition, concentrated power, bullying and cronyism grows within a party. And you guys may think, oh, Lisa, blah, 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 blah. But your peers in other cities have had enough. Democrats in Bridgeport, led by John Gomes, have access to the independent line of challenged the absentee ballot fraud and the incumbent, uh, Joe Gannon. Stanford Democrats for Reform are done with the party bullying in Hartford's density agenda in their city, uh, and they are rebelling. They have a town committee election March 5th. So I'm just hoping that one day, in conclusion, and some of you will have the courage to vote your conscience and stand up to the status quo like your peers have done in other Democrat cities uh, because the rest of us don't have a chance. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Britton. Uh, Ms. Diane Lorencella, please state your name and address. Is she? Yes. I'm, can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Okay, thank you. For the record, my name is Diane Loratella. I live at 21 Little Fox Lane. Uh, this evening, I uh, wanted to comment on a few items in my three minutes. I'll start with the one that uh, I know is of, of great importance to all of you, and that is the budget cap. I am not aware whether you will or you won't vote on it tonight, but I wanted once again to suggest that you need to go back and scrub some more because there are still more savings that can be achieved. Um, one thing that I noticed in the public meetings where there were public hearings without the benefit of until Friday um, was there was no discussion for you all about new revenue sources. And one of the things that I've talked about for several years is the need for a full-time grant person because many of the people on the staff that have become almost uh, have worked on grants, and of course you want to wordsmith according to the department's uh, uh, verbiage. We hired them to do other roles, and in other cities of our size, a full-time grant person is the one that would follow up with the grantor and write those reports, and, and it can be very tedious. We want our staff that was hired as engineers, for instance, to do that work, not grant writing. So I'm still disappointed that this still hasn't risen to your interest. Number two, under C, ordinance. Uh, under uh, The first one under city property sales, $50,000 is far too high to avoid public scrutiny. I think it should be lowered to $10,000, although that property in Rowayton was a giveaway at $1,000. I also think under the number two, the blight prevention, we have to really take a look at the zoning citation process. It's time for reform because it is just not working out as many of the hearing uh, items uh, last for a year, up over a year and uh, much to the chagrin of the neighbors that that are want to see justice. Uh, lastly, I wanted to state uh, that under the, uh, your, uh, Board of Estimate appointment for tonight, while I am not in any way commenting on the quality of the person that I read that you are planning to appoint, I am on the record for several years to say that since women in Norwalk uh, make up over 50% of the population, uh, we I believe we can do better. And I would like Mr. Camacho to step back and uh, the city look harder and actually put in an article or advertisement for qual for women that are interested in financial um, future of our city. I believe that we really need to have parity on this board. I do know, and I'm sure this will be said after- We're at three minutes. Uh, yeah, three minutes, yeah. I, I will wrap up, is that we have in Norwalk uh, hired lots of women who are 
helping run our city. And that is wonderful. And I have complimented the mayor and the council, but on boards and commissions, we should strive for 50% minimum. And we need an additional female to fill this role. And I'm very sad because I brought it up at the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women and with the DEI coordinator, who for reasons that I'm still waiting to hear- Three minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you very much. And uh, please reconsider this appointment position. It's very important for our city. Thank you. If there is anybody else who wishes to speak <clears throat> online, um, joining us by Zoom, please raise your hand electronically. Um, please raise your hand electronically if you would like to speak. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to address the council? Seeing none, we will close public participation. Next item on the agenda is uh, resignations and appointments. We only have one. Uh, we have an appointment of Mr. Edwin Camacho to the Board of Estimate and Taxation. Do I have a motion? I have a motion. Mr. Freyer? I'd like to say something. Um, I'm very privileged to uh, nominate uh, Ed Camacho to the BET. Um, this is kind of a homecoming for Ed. He served on the BET from um, 2014 to 2023 when he joined the uh, Common Council. Um, interestingly enough, I seem to be following him around since I was on the BET, worked with him very closely, and then wound up sitting next to him here on, on this uh, uh, dais. Um, Ed's a graduate of uh, Amherst College, where he got his bachelor's and went on to law school at the Indiana University. He's admitted to the bar in New York, Connecticut, the district uh, U.S. Uh, district Court in uh, Connecticut and New York, uh, and the U.S. Court of Appeals. Um, he has a wide breadth of knowledge uh, of uh, the city, uh, having served as the chairman of the Democratic Town Committee from 2014 to 2020. He was a member of the Norwalk Fair Housing Commission. He was a member and uh, actually chairman of the South Norwalk Community Center, so he knows the, the area, he knows the people. Um, I particularly, uh, uh, during this, I think particularly during this budget season, uh, Ed is gonna be a, uh, an invaluable asset to the be it, uh, Board of Estimate and Taxation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freer. Any further comments? Mr. Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would also like to support the uh, appointment of uh, Edwin Camacho to the Board of Estimate and Taxation. Um, uh, Ms. Camacho uh, and I also served on the BET. Actually, he succeeded me as the chairman of the BET. And I've always found him to apply the most important principle that I think each member of the BET should always aspire to, which is utilizing basic common sense when it comes to determining the appropriation of funds uh, across the, uh, the various departments of the city. And um, I've always found that to be um, a, a very refreshing and uh, a very important trait of Mr. Camacho. And uh, I'm sure his return to the BET will be a, an extreme asset to the BET, especially during the upcoming budget discussions, which will be um, uh, very difficult. So his resources will be appreciated. Thank you. Further comment, Mr. Goldstein. I, all I wanna add is, um, and I think Council, uh, Councilman Burnett, I think foregrounded this, which is we need the best people we can get and the, and the best assets we can get to help us through a really um, difficult set of discussions and policy decisions when it comes to our budget. Um, Ed Camacho is about as qualified as it gets, having not only been on the BET, certainly on the Common Council. I mean, he's someone who is a deeply analytical mind. Um, most of us have gotten the privilege to work with Ed. Um, and I can't think of a better person to make his return um, to the Board of Estimate and, Ta uh, Board of Estimate and Taxation than Ed. Um, I will be enthusiastically supporting this. Ms. Smith. Um, yes, I would also like to add my uh, support for Ed's return to the BET. I add. Um, I think that um, the, the timing couldn't be better. This is an extremely difficult uh, budget season, as we are all painfully aware. Um, and so his uh, experience 
and vision for the city of Norwalk will be invaluable at this time. Um, he knows um, when to draw the line, but he also knows when we need to push for, for what the city needs. So um, I fully support um, his return to the BET. Ms. Nijilski Eichner. Just to briefly join my colleagues, I was teasing Ed uh, not long ago about the fact that he was not serving the city for the first time in, oh, I don't know, a decade, two decades. And of course, immediately thereafter found out that, of course, he's coming back to, to serve. So I really appreciate your dedication to the city, your willingness to step up. We have benefited enormously, and I appreciate um, that commitment to service. Further comments or discussion? Ms. Young. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I've known Ed for quite some time as a resident at your business in District B um, and, and, and your um, time on the DTC. But what I have to really um, speak about is I really got to see a different side of you when you were on the council. And the questions that you asked were very thoughtful and insightful. And as uh, Ms. Nora Nijelski Eigner mentioned, you're thoughtful and methodical about what you're doing. And, and, and you care about the city. And I so appreciate that. I did see a different side, another side, um, a good side. And so I'm happy to hear that you're going back on to the BET. And I have to really just say, uh, address Diane Lorichella's comments about women being appointed commissions. And I think that that is something that we, we focus on and we, we want to get to that. Um, but you clearly need to be in that position. And I know that there will come another time when we can point, appoint a woman, a qualified first woman to that position. But in the meantime, we're happy to have you back. Hopefully you'll get a unanimous vote, which it sounds like you will, um, on the BET. So I appreciate you even wanting to come back to support. Further comment or discussion? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, I've known Ed for a long time and uh, Ed always steps up to the plate whenever he's needed, whether it be a DTC town chair, whether it be common council, BET. Uh, we all know that in those three positions, he makes a tremendous amount of money. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also, uh, he, whenever he is assigned to something, whenever he takes on a challenge, he puts his whole self, his whole self into it and uh, gives it his all. And, uh, you know, that's a, a, certainly a, a quality that we can all admire. So if there are no further comments or discussion, I will ask for a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Ms. McMurr is abstaining. Or, congratulations. Would you like to say anything? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the challenge is there, believe me. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda is just Mayor's remarks, as you probably saw uh, during the, uh, uh, well, it's reported in the hour that the East Norwalk train station will be closed for um, repairs, et cetera, from 11 March till uh, 30, uh, March 31st. It's uh, in con uh, construction due to the walk bridge. Uh, at that time, they're also closing the road underneath the railroad bridge over there for that period of time. It'll be closed for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three weeks. Uh, it's going to be a challenge going through that area where they have the uh, uh, detour marked very well. They'll have police officers there to assist, uh, but this is going to expedite the laying of the utilities and uh, for Eversource, under, I'm sorry, for, for uh, Frontier under the ground, and that'll expedite the process rather than having to close it periodically for six to eight weeks. Uh, this will be uh, done for th in three weeks. Uh, this week, uh, also coming on Sunday, we will be celebrating at the Norwalk Public Library on Belden Avenue, the Chinese New Year, which began on February 10th. This is the year of the dragon. Uh, the dragon represents good luck, intelligence, charisma, optimism, and strength, and is predicted to bring improvement and abundance. I wonder if he's going to help our budget. <laughs> At this festive and educational event, par uh, participants will get the chance to explore the customs of the Chinese New Year, enjoy dance performances by Lee Garden Dance Company and the Connecticut Chinese Education Association uh, Dance Group and more. Uh, now on Washington Street, the city is asking for entrepreneurs to step up uh, 
and uh, put in business proposals for a chance to win uh, free commercial space on Washington Street for a period of time. Uh, the contest aims to support small businesses and submissions are due by Friday, March 29th. You can learn more about this on our website. And last but not least, on March 23rd, the city is hosting an Easter egg hunt at the Mill Hill Historic Park uh, from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. So come and enjoy the festivities. Uh, that's all I have, uh, Ms. Young. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're gonna move down to 5-6-A, corporate, I know. Who's reading the consent calendar? Me. Are, but I have to move on to Stan McMurray is going to read the consent calendar. Let me see. So excited. Um, 6A, Corporation Council, number one, authorization to discussion, settlement, summit, handling system, v. City of Norwalk, executive session. 7A, finance and claims, number one, accept and approve the report of the claims committee dated February 2024. Number two, for informational purposes only, narrative on tax collections dated February 2024. Number three, for informational purposes only, monthly tax collectors reports dated January 2024. Number four, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Gov Connection Inc. in an amount not to exceed $109,646.89 for the purchase of 790 Microsoft Office 365 annual licenses. Gov Connection Inc. is on the state of Connecticut contract number NCPA01-144 account number noted. 7B, Recreation, Parks, and Cultural Affairs Committee. Number one, authorize the Mayor Harry W. Rilling to enter into a contract with Whittingham Cancer Center of Norwalk for the use of Calf Pasture Beach and immediate surrounding grounds for their Whittingham Cancer Center Walk, event to be held on Saturday, May 11, 2024, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Set up time Friday, May 10, 2024, from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. with teardown on Saturday, May 11, 2024. That needs to be corrected. By 3.30 p.m., approximately 750 people. Number two, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to enter into a contract with Triangle Community for the use of Veterans Memorial Park and immediate surrounding grounds for their Pride in the Park event to be held on Saturday, June 8, 2024, from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. Set up time Friday, June 7, 2024, from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., with teardown on Saturday, June 8, 2024, by 9 p.m. Rain date, Sunday, June 9, 2024, approximately 8,000 people. Number three, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to enter into a contract with Norwalk Seaport Association for the use of Veterans Memorial Park and immediate surrounding grounds for their Norwalk Seaport Oyster Festival event to be held from Friday, September 6, 2024, to Sunday, September 8, 2024. Set up time from Friday, August 16, 2024, at 8.45 a.m. with teardown by Monday, September 30, 2024, at 1.30 p.m., approximately 40,000 people. Number four, authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to enter into a contract with NMMA for the use of Calf Pasture Beach, Taylor Farm, and immediate surrounding grounds for their Norwalk Boat Show event to be held from Thursday, September 19, 2024 to Sunday, September 22, 2024, from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. Set up time by Monday, September 16, 2024, with teardown on Sunday, September 22, 2024, by 10 p.m., approximately 10,000 people. Number five. Authorize the mayor, Harry W. Rilling, to enter into a contract with Stepping Stones Museum for the use of Matthews Park and immediate surrounding grounds for their Stepping Stones Museum Kaleidoscope Circus Fall event to be held from Wednesday, March 26 to Sunday, March 30, 2025, from 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Set up time from Friday, March 21, 2025, through Tuesday, March 25, 2025, with teardown from Monday, March 31st through Wednesday, April 2nd, 2025, approximately 400 people. Number six, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Intelligent Marking USA Inc. DBA Turf Tank in the amount of $59,700 for the purchase of an autonomous Field Marking Robot Project Number 4331 from account number noted. Number seven, authorize the Mayor Harry W. Rilling to enter into a contract with ID Sign Systems, Inc. for Project Number 4325, Recreation and Park Signage Project, in an amount not to exceed $63,936 from account number noted. 
7B, authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to issue change order to ID Sign Systems, Inc. for project number 4325, Recreation and Parks Signage Project, in an amount not to exceed $9,590 from account number noted. 8A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to turf products of the source well purchasing contract number. Noted, for the solo source purchase of three Toro Workman GTX electric utility cars in an amount not to exceed $52,042.80. Account number noted. 8B, authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to issue a change order to turf products off the source well purchasing contract number noted for the solo source purchase of the three Toro Workman GTX electric utility carts in an amount not to exceed $5,200 from account number noted. Number nine, authorize the Mayor Harry W. Reeling to enter into a five-year operating license agreement with a five-year renewal option with Riverbrook Regional Young Men's Christian Association, Inc., YMCA, to operate recreation programs with approximately 2,000 square feet of designated space at the proposed Norwalk Community Recreation Center at 98 South Main Street. Terms of the agreement shall be as recommended by the Land Use and Building Management Committee. 7C, Ordinance Committee, number one, approve revisions to section 9-3, chapter 9, article 1, section 3, procedure for sale of city property. 7D, Public Safety and General Government, number one, authorize Mayor Harry W. Rilling to enter a lease agreement with the owners of 132 Water Street LLC for five years for $71,200 per year with 3% increases in the subsequent years of the Nor for the Norwalk Police Marine Division base, its public safety vessel and storage space, account number noted. Number two, Authorize the Mayor Harry W. Rilling to execute any and all documents and agreements necessary to increase the records fees associated with the request and release of body and dashboard camera video recordings to $30 per hour of video provided. Number three, authorize the Mayor Harry authorize the Mayor to execute a three-year agreement with Hartford Healthcare Medical Group for the 4264R Occupational Health Services. Number four, authorize the Chief Human Resources Officer and or designee to issue two one-year contract extensions on the Hartford Healthcare Medical Group contract. Number five, technical correction to the non-unit personnel benefits and compensation policy ordinance salary schedule that was before the council on January 9, 2024. The incorrect version of the policy was attached at that time. We are resubmitting this policy to make a technical correction. And Madam President, that is the reading of the consent calendar. Right, thank you very much, Ms. McMahon. For the, the, the consent calendar, all in favor? All right, that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. So that brings us to item uh, 7A5, Mr. Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, item 7A5 under the Finance and Claims Committee, uh, I'd like to read the following resolution. Whereas section 1-289 of the normal charter requires that a majority of the common council vote to establish a specific spending limit on local expenditures during the process of establishing the next fiscal year's operating budget. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Norwalk that the maximum limit on the total appropriation of the City of Norwalk for fiscal year beginning July 1, 2024 shall be no more than $440,611,996. <clears throat> this appropriation cap uh, represents total expenditures of $467,591,788 less es estimated into governmental grants of $26,979,792. Be it further resolved that the result of this vote and resolution be forwarded by the Clerk of the City of Norwalk to the Board of Estimate and Taxation. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move this item and uh, move into discussion. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, uh, this particular item um, uh, was re reviewed last week during a special meeting of the Finance and Claims Committee. Um, the, the requirement by charter is for the council to set the maximum amount for this operating spending for the ensuing fiscal year. 2024, 2025. Um, how do we arrive at this number? 
Uh, we have our budget di uh, director, uh, Mr. Tom Ellis, to take us through a presentation that will um, cover the details uh, related to how we derived at um, this current operating budget cap, but also the impact of this particular cap as it relates to uh, other variables, such as how will it affect the various mill rates in the districts, and also how those mill rates will be impacted by our recent revaluation and the impact on the grant list. Um, um, it's going to be a difficult year, but um, we're going to now move into discussion with um, Mr. Ellis presenting the information. Good. Brian, hear, hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, uh, as Greg said, I'm Tom Ellis. I'm the Director of Management of Management and Budgets. Did uh, this presentation on Thursday night at the Special Finance and Claims meeting. Um, if you have that in front of you, we did modify it slightly, a few formatting changes, and one or two new slides. Um, so, this is the calendar for the budget process. Uh, we basically kicked this process off in September and uh, get the pro forma budgets out to the all the departments by October. And then it works its way through the process. Right now, we are right about here. So we're setting the budget cap for the Common Council. I highlight here that there is one more public hearing that will be with the DEP on March 20th. And then it works through, works through uh, a few more meetings. And then the BDT sets the final cap sets the final cap and tax levy mm -hmm. on the first Monday of May, which this year happens to be May 6th. Here's where we are on the operating budget expenditures. Last week, we pre presented the approved and the original recommended. The original recommended totaled $442 million. That came out to a 4.5% increase for both the city and public schools for an overall percentage increase of four and a half percent. We went back and scrubbed in some cases several times with all the divisions and departments looking for every opportunity to to reduce spending where possible. So here's where we are now the yellow highlighted column the revised recommended that totals 440 million six hundred eleven nine ninety six which is what Greg just read regarding setting the cap and that equates to four percent for the city four percent for the board of ed four percent in total. Um, going down the line here, here are the percentages. If you recall reading or hearing, the mayor had originally is issued guidance for no less, no more than a three percent increase by department. Many of the departments were able to do that. Some were not. The biggest increases are ones that we cannot control. I bring to your attention pension plan, 2.2 million, 12 percent. We have no control over that. We have put pensions, pension funding in, and you, we do not want to be in a position where we have underfunded pensions like the state has been struggling with for many years. Contingency, that's a million point eight, uh, 122%. Um, this is a set aside for labor contracts that are uh, about to start. Sometime in two, fiscal 25, we will settle those labor contracts with all seven or eight unions. I can never remember which, which it is. Um, and then we will have to pay retro wages. So this is a set aside to um, have, a, have a balance to, to cover those retro wages wherever they end up settling. Um, debt service, the very first one, 2.2 million, five and a half. That is a function of our capital spending. So that is up to an, uh, five and a half percent this year, $2 million. The other ones that are, you know, sort of stand out, 17% here for chief of staff, not a tremendous amount of money, $157,000. That's because last year we had approved two hires um, for, for a half year. This year they're on board and they are here for the full year. So when you compare full year salary to last year's half year salary, it skews the percentage higher. Equity inclusion, that's uh, it's just training and education and, and some expenses to get that office up and running with supplies. 
I'm going to stop at each slide because there is a lot of data in this presentation. Does anybody have any questions about this part before we move forward? All right. So uh, everybody knows we went through our first, our, uh, first full physical revaluation since 2013. By statute, we have to do a full revaluation every five years. By statute, we have to do a full physical 10 years. What does physical mean? Those are the letters you got from the companies that were doing the appraisal. Those are the, the individuals that came to your door, wanted to look around your house. If you had done renovations, they asked to come inside. That is the full physical revaluation. So the city, as a result of that, the, the city of Norwalk's grand list went from 15 billion last year to 18 billion this year with the, um, with the revaluation. The increase in the overall grand list is entirely due to the residential valuations. Commercial grand list actually went down slightly. We, we call it flat, but it did actually go down slightly. So the skew between residential and commercial skewed towards residential. Last year was 66% residential, 34% commercial. This year, 71.5% residential, 28.5% commercial. You know, a lot of people talk about the apartments that have gone up lately. Those count as commercial, and that actually helped. If, if not for those apartments, the differential between commercial and residential would have been even greater. The chart up top just shows the, the median home value by district. You can see that goes anywhere from 30% to 61% in the sixth, second district. So we all know what home values have done, started with the pandemic, and it has just kept going. Questions on this one? Yes. A question. Um, what is the differential between the tax abatements that are still outstanding versus the... Um in the commercial sector? I don't have that. Mario, offhand, do you know? Mm. No. no. <laughs> I know you said a lot of them are coming, are kind of expiring soon. I was just wondering how much that will be coming in once they do expire. I'm sorry, could you speak louder? I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> not a lab talker. I was just kind of wondering, I, I know that a lot of the, not a lot, but a lot of the tax abatements are expiring soon. You were saying in our last meeting, and I was just wondering, like, when they do expire and they are full, paying the full amount, how much that will come in? Yeah, the tax abatements are in the enterprise zone yeah. where they're authorized. It's authorized by the state. We have an enterprise or uh, policy here. So uh, it all depends on when they expire. It's different times. So I'm just wondering, like, next year, how many will expire and will that? Pay into the you know and just to keep in mind with, with the enterprise zone typically uh what's done is it's a cascading effect so it may be um i think an abatement of like 90 percent year one then 80 70 60 50 40 it goes down i think over a seven year period um the average is 50 percent over the seven year period so the mall actually when we negotiated the land disposition agreement one thing we did negotiate was for the um uh, the abatement to be a flat, uh, an average of 50% of that rather than having this cascading effect because it would have a, a fairly significant effect on the city because it's such a big value. Um, so I, I think part of the answer is that um, as the uh, properties that do have abatements get further into the abatement period, further into that seven year period, uh, the, the percentage of the abatement is reduced each and every year. So towards the end, not I, I do understand that I was trying to figure out what percent of their, what they owe in taxes is abated so that next year when, if they're paying full, you know, the full amount, how, what the differential is. I think we'd have to get that from the tax assessor. We don't have that information mm -hmm. right in front of us because when they start the tax abatement uh, in the enterprise zone, <clears throat> as the corporation council said, it goes for seven years and they start on different times. So whenever, the abatement is authorized. Right. So, but so that will be an increase yeah. theoretically when when so it expires. So the the uh, tax assessor would be able to provide that information. So, is that in our projections at this point? Or in years? Yeah, are projected. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Anything else on this one? Okay, this, uh, this chart here is um, 
presented to highlight the impact of the revaluation. So if you see the up at the top of the title there, this is this assumes a flat budget. In other words, if we did a copy paste from our fiscal 24 to this year, zero increase anywhere um, and a zero draw from the rainy day fund, this is what would have happened to taxes. So you can see that the mill rate, the average mill rate goes down about 15 to 16%. But the change in the tax bill is up anywhere from 15% to 36%, depending on the district. So this, this is supposed to highlight just how impactful the revaluation is to the average, uh, average tax bill. So this top part here, the flat budget, that's the uh, the same chart that you just saw on the previous page. The one on the bottom here, this is the one that we arrived at last week. 4% increase for the Board of Ed, 4% for the city, $8 million drawdown from the rainy day fund. Personal property at 27 mills uh, for all districts. And the motor vehicle rate going up two points to 32.46 mills. So you can see all the way down here at the bottom, the increase against anywhere from 16% to 37%. Any questions on this one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, this slide, uh, all right. again, sorry. Um, could you just explain your last chart there. Which one? Variance in median tax bill, the very bottom one. Oh, okay. So this is the difference. Um, I'll, I'll do the first district. So 0% for everything and no draw from the rainy day fund. The tax bill for the first district would be 1774 right here. And down here with the 4% and the 8 million draw, it's 18, 1800. So it's really not a huge difference. That's the difference between those two right there, the 18 and the 1774. And same same for all the districts. Any other questions? Okay. No, thank you. Yeah. So this is, uh, again, the blue box is the last chart on the, on the previous page, our 4% across the board, $8 million draw. Um, one of the things we we looked at, well, we actually looked at many things. We did somewhere between fifteen and different fifteen and twenty different scenarios, and different mill rates uh, um, to try to come up with the impact or um, uh, rate increase to, to taxpayers. Um, our neighbors in Stanford recently just started doing a, uh, a phase in, and what that is is taking the valuation and staggering it over a period of time, whether it's two years or four years. So this first one is a four-year phase in, again, 4% across the board, $8 million draw. And you can see that the, the impact in the first year to the different districts is, is pretty dramatic. So for example, in the sixth ta taxing district, it went from um, ch you know, change in the tax bill from 3,700 right here to 7,400 right here. And again, the reason for that, for that tremendous impact is because the $3 billion increase in the grant list was all on the residential side. If commercial had gone up as much as residential had, there'd be much more parity um, and, the, and the increases would not be as dramatic. So we looked at a number of different phasing scenarios and it just doesn't help anybody, especially in year one. Jim? Uh, Tom, um... I'm jumping ahead to the, the second phase in the second year, that 5,000, um, let's go to the six taxing jurisdictions, you've got about a $5,900 uh, dollar increase that's over the previous year, right? That's in addition to the previous year. So we're we talking about maybe $13,000 over two years in that case. Uh, so phase, oh, the four year phase in. Yep. Okay, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, the, the first one the first one's a four year phase in. The first year would be seven thousand dollars, right? Correct. What do you have any idea what the second year would look like? 
Um, no, I don't think we're in the two year phase in with the would that 5,900 then go to, you know, what would be the impact of the phase, the rest of the phase in, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I don't have, I don't have that here with me, um, okay. but I can, I can look for it, Mario. I give you that one just to know if you do a four year phase and it's a 20, taking 25% of the increase each year, if that's helpful, I mean, even though the numbers aren't there. Yeah. Conceptually, it's, it's taking the 100% of the increase and Dividing it over four years. Yeah, so we'd, 25 be better, each year. we'd be much better off taking it in the first year because it's just going to continually go up geometrically mm -hmm. year after year. There would be an increase every year, yeah. an artificial increase, essentially an artificial increase. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so you'd be taking 25% each year. And you're not and you're not going to be adjusting. Well, you would adjust the grand list accordingly. Wouldn't you not? Would you not? Mm -hmm. When you have to, uh, I mean, you've got new the grand building. Go the grand yeah, the grand list will go, go up. Because because conceivably, yeah. you, as the mayor pointed out, you'd have a twenty-five percent artificial increase. Yeah. Um, one thing you do get each year is is an increase based on increasing your grand list for new yeah. construction. Um, even if the work's not finished, um, based on the status as of October one, the new commercial, or new personal property, with new motor vehicles. So we're better off taking it the first year. The business decision, but. Um, you can see the numbers. I mean, there is, yeah. as uh, Tom pointed out, there, there's this issue of the balance between the increase in the commercial and residential and the you know, requirements of the run and the numbers and all the choice. Yeah. Ms. Ayers? Jalen. I'm sorry? This is me. Oh. Yeah. Oh, he did. Okay. Um, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ellis, good evening. Can you do me a favor and go back to slide six? I, I'm overlooking something. I just want to make sure I'm processing what you're giving me correctly. Yeah, I'm there. Okay. So if we're looking at the first taxing district and we're going down to the bottom of the page, in yellow, it says um, fiscal year 25 recommend, recommended medium tax bill 7,856. 54. Thank you for the. And then the approved is 6,025. Um, is that the difference between four percent and four and a half percent? What is the difference? No, no, that the the, the approved median tax bill is from last year. That's two two thousand twenty four. I was reading it. Yeah, the, the line right above it is our recommendation at the current moment. That's yeah, and that's reflective of the four percent right now. So that's reflective of the four percent. Right. And then when you scurry on down to your bottom, um, the variance in um dollar change, that's fifty. Five dollars is at the four percent. Correct. So if we're doing a half more, is my math correct? It'll be a hundred and ten. If we're at four point five percent, conceivably, yes. Okay, just want to make sure the yeah. math was. Correct. I have degrees, but it's not in math. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions, uh, Ms. Nijelski Eichner? Sorry, I have, I have two questions. I first want to go back to that because that math does not make sense. Back, back to six? Back to six. I thought it was me. No, so I just want to double check. So the variance, as I am understanding this slide, that $55 is the difference between doing a 0% increase and doing a 4% increase, correct? Yeah, th yeah. so it's that 1774 right here versus the 1829. Right. So if we were to go up to 4.5%, that variance is not going to go up to 110. It would go up to 60 or... You know, it would be if a 0.5 addition is not going to double that number. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. 65 yeah. and a quarter. 65 and a quarter. Thank Something you, Mario. Like, yeah. Something yeah. like So that. it's not the 110. No. No, no it would add about this. This is zero to four. Right. Take 55 divided by four. Yeah. And that's your multiplier. So, so yeah, so it would take it up 65. Uh, thank you, Mario. Um. Okay. Thank you. If that, I wanted to double check on math. So then I have a question on your next slide. Uh, back to eight. Yes, but if anyone else has questions on this. Well, yeah, I had a question. Mr. Seed. On that, the, this slide, I don't see an option. I don't know if you looked at it, if we did like a 0% increase, uh, 8, 8 million draw from the rainy day fund. Well, that will be wanted to highlight was just the revaluation. So we, we included none of our variables. Yeah. Zero for the draw, zero. Just okay. we, we wanted it to be strictly the, re, the impact of the revaluation. Okay. And- to be truthful, zero percent isn't practical. We have at least three percent in, yeah. in labor nego labor contracts that have to be covered every year. Oh. 
Further questions? Mine's on the next slide. Ms. Dunn? Mine's on the next slide, too. Um, sorry. Uh, seven or eight? <laughs> um, the the phase-in, the four-year phase-in. Okay. Is, is that with the idea that even though it's a fiscal year 25, if we have a four-year phase-in, you're assuming that the budget would stay flat for four years? Um, those numbers be the same? No. Um, we would... As I was just mentioning with uh, uh, with Jalen, the at, at minimum it would be the cost of the labor contracts, right? So three percent, and then you have new hires and inflation and new initiatives and so on and so forth. So, so it'll be compounding if you do yeah. that. Yeah. So we didn't actually do you know carry over the budget for a three to four year forecast when when we saw these results from the phase in <laughs> for the first year, it was enough to tell us that it wasn't worth pursuing. It's the Joseph Eichner. Um, and I apologize. I do not understand this slide. I got to be very honest. So um, I I just, I genuinely conceptually, logically, I'm not understanding why a four-year phase-in would result in double the increases in the first year. So the four-year phase-in, we're getting a $3,600 increase in District 6 in the four-year phase and we're getting a $7,300. So why would phasing in actually make it higher? I think I'm just missing something here. Um, Paul Gorman, you wanna articulate this one? Because our, our tax assessor is on the line. Oh, great, and he, thank he you. He can do a little bit better job. <laughs> thank you, Paul, than I appreciate make... that. Uh, my pleasure. I'll, I'll, I'll try to live up to Tom's uh, billing that I just got. Basically, what it comes down to when you're looking at a four year phase in a two year phase in when everything, as Tom had mentioned earlier, is so um, sided towards the residential increase in a four year phase. And as Mario was explaining, it's you're grabbing 25 percent per year. But in that first year, you're grabbing 25 percent of the um, increase to the grand list, but you're still grabbing the full increase to the budget. So you're having to pay for all that extra budget with only a 25% to increase to the 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 uh, assessed values. In a two-year phasing, you're grabbing 50% of it, and that's why there's the difference. And to Tom's point about why it just doesn't make sense is because when Stanford did it, Stanford had a much more balanced reval that their their commercial kept up more with they're residential, but some of that has to do with when they revalued. They revalued last year, and so the increases weren't as stark on the residential side. They had one year less of uh, prices rising, and the commercial didn't lose as much. I mean, it's just a function of timing, but it really is just a simple math of you're, you're, you have the whole pie of the budget and the budget increases and what are you applying to it? So in the case of not doing a phasing, you have the entire increase to spread it out over. In a phasing, you only have percentages of that increase to spread the budget increases out over. I hope that explains it. I can be helpful just to add one thing. Uh, I said simple math. There's nothing simple about trying to figure out the phase when you're running the numbers in the phasing because in some ways it's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, you figure out phasing it in, so it should be less of an increase. One thing is we were all grappling with this. We had a lot of meetings with the mayor and Tom and Tom and Paul, and Paul, there was just a lot of us going over this stuff and trying to figure it out. Greg, um, Greg, yeah, Greg was in all these meetings. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're a four, you just give you an example, you have four year phase in, uh, the mill rate goes down each year. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, so so you're actually, your mill rate goes down, even though your budget goes up, because as as, uh, as as Mr. Alice stated, you're gonna have increases in your budget, budget every year, if not just for, for contracts. Um, so why would your mill rate go down? Well, your mill rate goes down because each and every year you're getting an artificial bump of 25% of, not the entire grant list, but 25% of that portion of the grant list that had an increase from the base revaluation year. So if you look at a, a chart of a four year uh, phase in, and we did, one thing that's a constant is no matter how you do the math, you know, within reason, you're always going to have your mill rate go down each and every year of the four years. So that's why it get, um, you have a, a more dramatic change with the with the um, with the phase in in year one for the residential properties. 
Okay, thank you. That's one one reason, that one factor that plays into it. Mr. Goldstein? Just to put a cap on this, I just think it's worth asking more generally. Because um, I think one of the things that, Tom, I think you and Paul both said was that were the facts on the ground different, i.e. the disparity between the commercial and the residential re uh, uh, um, reval so different? Is that essentially, um, the, essentially, I mean, out of whack is not the right way to put it, but definitely, what is it? I think it's 70, I wrote it down, it was 70, um, 71 and a half residential versus 28 and a half commercial. Um, I would assume it is not best practice or standard practice um, for municipalities with a residential versus commercial disparity, or frankly, the other way around, um, you know, so, uh, such a great disparity to, in, to engage in a phase. I would imagine that's not best practice. Is that correct? Well, based on what we saw in Stanford, uh, their, their commercial percentage is, is higher than ours, and that's why it worked for them. Um, right, but the, the I thought the, the explanation was essentially that Stanford wasn't a good comparison because their residential and commercial percentages were closer to even. Right. Here we're at, we're at a very different set of facts. The residential is quite different from commercial. And so what I was wondering is in terms of um, budgetary expertise and especially you know, municipal budgetary expertise, given the fundamental fact that the residential versus commercial is so different, I would imagine it's just generally not a good practice to engage in a phase in just by virtue of that alone. Yeah, well, I, I can say that it's it's pretty rare to do any kind of phase in. I think uh, when we were going through this, Mario was looking for other examples and it was Hartford and there weren't a whole lot out there in the last 10 years. Yeah, right? we, we, we thoroughly researched um, what communities have done, what communities have done phase ins in the last 10 years. And surprisingly, there were not a lot. I can just tell you, because I do represent a lot of other municipalities, and in particular, I do a lot of tax work. So I've got brought in in different municipalities over the last few years um, to look at the same, the similar issue. A lot of municipalities I know looked into a, a phase in um, in the last few years and decided not to do it. Um, and so uh, some, some of those discussions were public and some of them uh, not disclosed publicly, but um, what Norwalk has dealt with with regard to seeing an increase in the residential and a decrease in certain segments of commercial, particularly office and retail, is consistent with what you see throughout the state of Connecticut, particularly yeah. in Fairfield County. Um, in Norwalk, quite frankly, you know, one of the things is people want to live here, and so your residential did really well. Um, commercial, I don't think, did worse than in other places, probably better, because um, I think commercial values still hold pretty well in Norwalk, but the, the trend that you've seen here is similar everywhere in the state. I guess the only thing I was just trying to underscore, and I agree with everything you just said, was just to say that um, there's a very clear distinction to be made. For, so if people say, hey, why, you know, Stanford did a phase down, phase out, that, phase <laughs> in, why aren't we? There's a very clear reason why we wouldn't want to do that and why that wouldn't be advantageous to taxpayers. That's the sense I was getting, and I just wanted to yeah, I just wouldn't say it's one thing. I would say there's a number of different factors sure. that yeah. play into it when you do the math and you run all the different scenarios. That, um, so there's a lot, a number of factors that go into it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Further questions right now? Um, this uh, just I'm sorry. really basic questions for my own education. When tax dollars come in, do they come into an interest bearing money market account or is it just a basic account? Um, well, we have a, a revenue line item for for property taxes um, and that counts as cash on hand and we actively manage our cash on hand uh, both in our capital fund account as well as the general fund. Um, we spread the money around through a whole number, uh, a number of different banks and institutions, uh, most of them local and uh, yeah, the direct, the controller's office actively manages that. So is that, are they interest bearing accounts? Yeah, yeah, we make, somewhere in the neighborhood of two to 2.5 million a year in interest. Okay. So, but if we take, if we get money later and we're, and we're looking at interest rates going down, there's talk of, uh, you know, interest rates going down federally, then the money that we cut, we take in is actually losing a little bit. Of well, money. Not it, much, I mean, but still. So before inflation took off, we were making probably a million and a half dollars a year on on our yeah on our on our cash on hand. I just now wanted the, to understand that. Yeah. Basically. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. That, that is actively managed both by the controllers and the professionals and local banking institutions. Thank you. I appreciate it. If any further questions at this moment? Um, would you continue? All right. In conclusion, um, significant overall increase to median tax bills. Uh, you know, we've been talking about this uh, through the whole presentation. It's the revaluation and the, and the skew between residential and, and commercial. And as we were just uh, speaking extensively about the revaluations uh, for several of the 15 to 20 uh, variable models that we ran, and the impact would have been larger. We just saw that on the on the previous slide. And our recommendation is the best case scenario with with many variables contributing to this. Um, so our latest greatest is that 4.4.0% for both the city and board of ed and an $8 million drawdown. Okay, so questions and comments. Ms. McMurray. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I would like to see a scenario where we run the numbers for a four and a half and a 5% increase. I want to see what that does to the taxes. Please and thank you. Oh, uh, we did yeah, do they, that. They, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, oh, I thought it was uh, longer, page, but then I didn't. Uh, uh, you sent them to us early. Hey, page seven. Uh, okay, thank you. I, thought, I had requested it, and I was like, oh, no. Yeah, no, it's, uh, so. I thought, I thought we saw it, but we were flopping around a lot, and then we didn't go through it. That would so, be great. Yeah, so Up on this side a little bit. The, uh, <laughs> The, the blue box is our 4% recommendation with the 8 million draw. And then you've got four and a half and then 5%. And you can see that really the, you know, the tax bills do not go up that, uh, that much in between. So it goes, it would go from 22 or 21,975 to 22,119 and 22,263. Um, so there you have it. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate You're that. Welcome. Further comment or discussion? Ms. Najoski Eichner. I do not have any questions for Tom. I have comments. So I think if other people have questions, I defer. Oh, no, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So thank you, Tom. I really want to um, thank you and I want to thank everyone in the department. I know this has been an enormous amount of work already. I don't know why Ed is looking forward to this. But. <laughs> I, yes, I don't, I don't either. Actually, it's just starting. So Yes. As I said, it's been a tremendous amount of work already. I can't even, I know there's a tremendous amount more to come. Um, and I think that, uh, and obviously, I mean, this is a reality, right? This is a reality that is not particularly Norwalk. It is driven by factors entirely outside our control. Um, it uh, in fact, we have done, I think, our you know, made efforts to mitigate some of this disaster mm -hmm. we all saw coming in the sense of trying to increase housing, trying to increase housing stock, um, and we can only do so much locally. Um, but I think this slide here, you know, and, and Ms. McMurray's question um, is really a slide I, I want to focus on a little bit. Um, I, it is very admirable and absolutely correct that we need to spend only what we need to spend. And I think that that is, you know, I really appreciate the incredible efforts being done to pare back the budget, to think about what is necessary. At the same time, I really hope that these conversations are also driven by the question of where we can be more efficient. And sometimes that means spending a little bit more in order to get a little bit more. Um, you know, an area that I think you'll hear from some other folks on, you know, but technology is one that has come up repeatedly. I think Ms. Ayers has been on this subject for quite some time. Um, I've experienced it both as a council member and as a user of city services. There are a number of places where um, we have staff members expending energy doing mm -hmm. tasks that are below their skill set because we have not invested in the technology to streamline and simplify and allow them to or even quite frankly, in some instances, we even have the software. We just don't have the tech personnel to help them do that, to use it, to get it installed, to optimize the process and then be able to go forward. So they're actually using their skill set in their best areas as opposed to, you know, keeping everything going. And right. I, I've heard a lot of compliments about the staff. It's totally accurate. We are getting it done, right? With a, you know, with at a 4% level, we are getting it done, we're delivering, but are we optimizing? And I think that, so my question really is to say, as you're pushing on the departments for to cut and, you know, to really streamline, 
also asking the question, can we spend a little bit more here and actually then do a lot more? Um, Ms. Lorchella mentioned a grant writer. That's something else that a number of members of this council have spoken about for years. A grant writer would substantially increase our revenue opportunities, would more than pay for themselves. It would make tons of sense from my perspective to expend the money to add such a person to our budget because they will bring in more than, than they cost. And I think we really need to look at opportunities like that and not just say to folks, hard line, how much can you pair back? But strategically, what's, what's most valuable here? What if we invest in this now? We won't have to pay more for you know, in the future. Um, you know, maintenance costs is another thing that comes to mind. The city, I think, has learned hard lessons um, in our school construction. You know, the mayor has led the charge on rebuilding our schools. Why have we had to rebuild so many of our schools? Because we deferred maintenance for so long that they literally <laughs> drained their roofs and crumbled. And I think so. This, I think this is the really fine line we need to walk in this budget is. Um, asking those hard questions, not just can you do without this, but how do we optimize and do the best we can for the city? And if it's a little bit spent here or a little bit cut there or a little bit spent here so that we're saving a lot more next year, those are decisions that are worthwhile. And I know they're very hard to make and they're very hard. I think as the council, we don't have line and authority. We can't sit here and tell you which things those things are, but at the same time, um, I think we really want to, I really want to urge you to think that way and think strategically so that we're not just getting information back that, well, we paired it as far as we could. I wanna hear we paired things that aren't working or aren't necessary or outdated, or you know we've gone without and turns out we don't need, but we've decided that investing here, here, and here is going to make things work better. And we will be, we will be um, you know, more able to afford things long-term for the city. And again, I think that really gets to this four versus four and a half percent. The budget impact on our citizens is not large. Now that doesn't mean we go willy-nilly, it doesn't mean we go crazy, right? But it does mean that if there's a little bit that we need to do. And so that's, I, you know, I could go on on that, but I think the point is clear and I really appreciate the thought that's going into this, but I hope that message is also going out to the departments. Think strategically, give us strategic information about return on investment. Tell us where, you know, the 19 positions that got proposed that we, you know, said no to, would one of them bring in more revenue than it costs? Would one of them mean that actually five people are free to do more of their job more efficiently? And so we're actually getting more bang for our buck. I think those are questions that also need to be asked. Okay. Yeah, th absolutely. Those co uh, conversations do happen quite frequently when we're talking with department heads. Uh, when they, if they ask for uh, software, if they ask for personnel, we always ask, you know, what's the benefit? What is going to happen as a result of that? And oftentimes, you know, we just find ourselves in a habit of, well, there's a vacancy here, let's fill it. Uh, right now, what we're doing is saying, this vacancy may have existed for six months or a year. You've done without it for six months or a year. Do we need to fill this? And if not, where else can that money go? So we do a lot of that in, in the scrubbing process. We do a lot of that uh, asking, and the, the department heads, I give them a tremendous amount of credit. Uh, they're all very passionate about their position. They want to do the best job they possibly can. Uh, they ask for what they uh, need. They also ask for what they want. And, uh, and, and we work together to try to, like I said, uh, optimize uh, any new expenditures or any new personnel so that we are going to be ending up in the long run saving cash. Uh, what I said when I uh, uh, asked for the efficiency study, efficiency doesn't necessarily mean you're going to spend less. It means maybe you're going to spend more, but what's the outcome? So, you know. uh, Any further comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Seed and then Mr. Freyer. Just had a comment on that. I think that all of us on the council should be thinking about is really the effect that this has on the people at all. Um, looking at these numbers, especially just with the revalve, is scary. Um, today, I looked at um, rentals and and houses on the market, and it's scary to think. Like peers of mine, I thought back to the people that I know in high school. Um, I know more peers that used to live in Norwalk than actually still live here in Norwalk. Um, there's a lot of people who went to the schools when they were old and, and run down and their kids aren't going to be able to enjoy these new schools that are here in Norwalk because they can't afford to live here. Um, and I think that's what we need to be thinking about with this budget is the, the citizens, because a lot of people do want to live here, 
But the people who have lived here in my lifetime for 32, 31 years, they can't stay here. Um, you have seniors who want to retire here and they can't afford to retire here. They worked all of their life and they can't afford because these taxes are increasing so much. Um, in District A, I'm um, talking about uh, like $166 increase a month um, in taxes. Um, that's that's scary. People on a fixed income or people are not making a lot of money. Um, it's just scary. And I think that we need to be thinking about that. Um, my colleague, um, Councilman Wiggins, talked about like we're, we're, we're two people who, who might be kicked out because of the rising cost of living here in Norwalk. And it's really scary um, to think about. And I think that we really need to think about the people who, who are living here. Because a lot of people want to live here. And Norwalk is one of the best places in the country, um, in the state to live. Um, but we should make sure that the people who lived here and worked hard to live here could stay here in Norwalk. Um, and and that's, that's just on the top of my mind and my heart. Um, because I have a lot of peers and friends who who just can't afford to live here anymore. And, and this is scary um, with the revile and the effect that it's going to have on the citizens of Norwalk. Thank you, Mr. C. Mr. Freer. Yeah, I'd like to just um, follow up on, on both those points that, that were made. I think, first of all, the um, what the mayor had mentioned about scrubbing the numbers, you know, having been on the BET for five years, um, we go through every single one of those lines and we ask the question, not how much can you cut, but how much do you need uh, to, to, to do your job? Um, in some cases, people come and say, I need more, more, I need another head. Well, what are you going to do with that head? How much is that going to really save us? What kind of value added is that person? If you can make it a good point out of that, if you can make that point to any one of the people on the BET, they'd be happy to, to fight for you to get that to get that additional person in. But we can't just say, I think we ought to have a grant writer without a detailed list of what that grant writer is going to do whether it's a webmaster, whether it's an IT person, whatever. You know, I talked to somebody the other day about an IT person. He said, you would add some IT people? Don't IT people save us money? Don't you cut people when you have good IT people? Um, but the second thing I think is what um, Jalen brings up. I look at these numbers and I'm in the six taxing district and I fell off my chair when I saw it. Um, yeah, there are people in Rowayton that can probably take a deep breath and they can swallow that. But when I looked at the other districts, I was really scared. That is really devastating to people. What he said is, it really hurts me because this is a town that, um, I remember my my daughter, when she, uh, when the first bit of, bit of writing she ever did, she talked about, and you know, when she was writing her college essay, talked about the diversity in, in Norwalk, and that's why that's why she wanted to go to school in Norwalk. The diversity was there, and she had friends all across uh, different areas of the school of, of the city. That's going to go away. Okay, you, you're going we're going to lose that if we start adding or playing around with the budget, trying to put a little bit more in there. Well, it's only a little bit. It's only about twenty bucks here. It's only about fifty bucks there, and before that, you're talking real money. So. Um, I think we have to be very, very, very extremely careful. We've got to now start to think about, here's a wake up call. We've got to start to really look at that efficiency study. The day is right. Doesn't mean necessarily that you can save a lot of money, but it means that we should take a look at it and we should start to put some kind of a strategic uh, program together that's going to see how we can get the most out of the, what we have today and, and save us our, our money there. That's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wiggins, and then Ms. Smith. To echo um, Jalen, you know, just thinking of and Jim, just thinking about, you know, my community that I grew up in, you know, to be able to to be here and live here, you know, I tell people all the time I love this city, but when I look at this budget, to Jalen's point, it's like I might be one of those people that I get kicked out of the city because of like, you know, taxes going up and impacting the rent, right? And have no desire to buy property in the city because of, you know, the property, but I don't think you get a good bang for your buck. So, you know, with saying all that, I'm just thinking, this was echoed before, uh, like, what's the trade-off? What's the trade-off when 
we raise our the taxes? Are the schools getting better? Right? The the percentages going up of the schools, are the schools getting better? Um, I deal with a lot of students. And to me, you know, I, I don't see the schools getting better. Right. So if we're gonna go to the people and we're gonna propose this budget, um, what are we gonna say to the people to say, all right, listen, this is why we already know the reasons that you know you all explain, but it's like how are their lives getting better? You know, how are my children's lives getting better? And that's that's what's important to me, right? It's like, all right, if the budget's going up, but, you know, we getting more services or, you know, kind of to uh, Nora point, we getting a, a grant writer that's going to give us, you know, something out of it. Um, It makes sense. But I can't, you know, even though we, we see the studies and, and this is one of the best cities to live in, but when it comes to, you know, people that's impacted in, in, let's just call it what it is, minority communities, it's not. It's, it's, it's not the best city because the resources is not hitting these community as I feel like it needs to. So, in, in, in fact, what's happening is people are getting kicked out. I, to Jalen's point, I can't name more than 20 of my friends that still live in, in Norwalk. And the people that do live in Norwalk, it has to be on some sub, you know, subsidized housing. And that's not right either, right? Like, how can we get people to really be able to live in Norwalk and enjoy Norwalk and build some stake in equity in this city that they help build ultimately, right? So um, it, it's, I said this numerous times, it's scary. It's a tragic, and I might be on the chopping block. So how, you know, and I'm I'm representing the city, I'm volunteering my time, well, you can pay 50, 46 hours. <laughs> <laughs> to, to my time to represent this city and represent my community, but I might be on the chopping block, you know. And I think, you know, as a community, we have to hear, you know, voices like myself, Jalen, and you know, the people that we represent. Ms. Smith. Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, a few comments. Um, you know, th this reval. You know, we're all very blessed to live in such a great city that, uh, you know, our property values are so valuable. And um, but uh, on the other side of that, um, this will financially be painful for every one of us sitting in this room. For all of our constituents, this is going to be very hard. Um, and I I want to also take a minute to uh, to thank. Um, to thank you, Mayor, Mario, Tom, uh, Greg, um, and everyone who worked on this um, so diligently. I have no doubt that you are thinking of um, the efficiencies that we need to to take, but while also you know thinking of the effect that it's going to have on our taxpayers. Um, I do want to say that, you know, we, we know, you know, a lot of people have been clamoring to see the operating budget line by line. Um, and I do appreciate that you were finally able to get that up on the website. It's very difficult for me to read, um, you know, 350 pages. Um, and so I do look forward. I, I am hoping that we will have that book. Is it possible we'll have it this uh, week? I'm working on it as fast as I can. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully within the next week to 10 days. Okay. But, you know, I, I, the one thing I do want to say is I don't feel comfortable voting without really having had the opportunity to go through that. And that, because that's where we see all the work that you've done. Right. Um, and so um, I feel like I need more opportunity to, uh, to look through that before I can make a decision. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, but yeah, um, this is this is a tough one. Toughest I have experienced, I believe. Miss Ayers, and then Mr. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I want to encourage my colleagues to be courageous. We were elected not to act on impulse, nor were we elected to act in our own fear. We do have to be realistic and understand how things impact us. Um, and, and listening to many of the comments that have um, went before me, 
these things that have been said, we have been saying them for years. It's not a news talk. We consistently said that people have been priced out of the city of Norfolk. Um, the reevaluation is a process of the city. It is going to happen. It happens periodically. Um, and, and so we do our best with what we have. But I have to um, amplify something that Nora says. When we look at services, we need to look at the quality of the service and not the quantity of the service. When you give people better quality of service, they are more um, in tune to stay and invest because of the quality. We have a lot of things going on in our city that makes us unique, that sets us apart from our neighboring um, cities. But that doesn't mean that everything is quality. So as we are um, encouraging, I guess the word we're using is scrubbing um, the budget, I hope some of the conversation and I hope some of the information that is given back to this council is the quality and the impact of the services that we already have and how we can elevate them to make sure that the quality of the services that every constituent is getting is impactful. I have been on my soapbox, and I guess it's about time for me to get back on my soapbox to really emphasize our IT department. It's not a position. It's not a webmaster or whatever other. It's, it's a department that is so crucial to the functioning of the city. Unfortunately, um, many of us have experienced hatred through mail and through technology. We need cybersecurity, period. We need better cybersecurity than what we have. And the only way you can get it is you got to pay for it. So maybe we need to evaluate, not necessarily spend more or less, but evaluate where our dollars are going to make sure that things that are happening are getting answered in a timely manner and a quality manner. I said last night um, that there are certain things that we should have that are non-negotiable. My non-negotiable are our youth. In that subgroup of youth are um, children that are identified as sped population and the safety of all residents in our town. Those things we should not argue about. We should not um, banter or have anything negative. We should all be able to come to a common consensus that that's where we start. So I encourage my colleagues to let us find common consensus. We are very used to the budget season for this room to be filled with people and people to come to the podium. And we're here for hours and we're listening and listening. Please do not let the lack of public participation make you think that people are okay with what is going on. You have to get out of your seat and do your own due diligence. You have to speak to your constituents and you really have to evaluate how the, the decisions we make impact lives. This serious business people. And I encourage you to not act in fear, but be co courageous because that's what you were elected to do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Mr. Goldstein. I, I think it's always hard to follow Nicole I there. But <laughs> I, 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 I just want to say, I do, I do agree, of course, with the notion that um, we need to be um, fiscally strategic and also fiscally responsible. I think the counterweight um, to what Nicole says is, and it's not really a counterweight as much as it is sort of a joining principle, which is on the one hand, we want to make sure that we're spending in a way that benefits Norwalkers as much as possible, but also within our means to do so. I, I think that one of the, you know, I, I Councilman Freyer calls it a wake-up call, but I think that sometimes uh, I, I would imagine a reevaluation is as much revealing as it is, um, you know, of the sort of the current conditions and where we are now and, you know, national trends. Um, it is not a reflection on how this how the city has been spending money, you know, over the last five or ten years. It's more a reflection of the value of properties, the point that people want to live here. And frankly, it's it removes the it removes a veil from something that we've been sort of 
slowing down over the last couple of years by using federal dollars, in particular ARPA dollars, to help um, provide tax relief actually to our residents. Um, I, I don't know the actual figures in my head, Greg, I know them off the top of his head, but in the term of millions of dollars of federal money used for tax relief, of which is, and that's the um, American Rescue Plan, this was the COVID era money, um, that's no longer available. I mean, uh, that program, the money has been um, allocated and there isn't a whole new set of ARPA funds coming in. So we are left with this new reality um, that the price of real estate has gone up in large part due to things that, as Councilwoman Ayers says, things we know about. There's not enough housing in Norwalk. There's not enough affordable housing in Norwalk. And that doesn't, doesn't just mean federally subsidized affordable housing, but also enough housing and enough housing in our housing stock where people can afford it. What Councilman Seed and Councilman Wiggins said is incredibly important. A lot of people in particular who grew up here or people who work in our public sector right now literally can't afford to live here despite the fact that they come here to work every day. Fewer than half of our police officers, I'm pretty sure, live in Milwaukee. I'm pretty sure that's also true with um, many of our civil servants. And, and so it does, I think, present us with this challenge to not only make sure that we scrub the budget and make sure that our physical house is in order, but also look at this as a, as a marker and, and a challenge. I mean, the fact of the matter is we have this humongous disparity now with 71.5% residential versus 28.5% commercial. And I realized, and I think that what um, Tom Ellis said earlier in one of his earlier slides is incredibly important. And in fact, actually, a lot of the apartments that have come in count as commercial property. Mm -hmm. The increase of responsible development of apartments in the city is actually going to end up reducing people's tax bills because it's going to even out the residential versus commercial disparity. And obviously, as a renter myself, I can tell you, yes, renters um, do pay taxes as part of their rent. But it is going to help even out that disparity um, if we make sure that we um, do responsibly develop the apartments, you know, um, you know, and other forms of development so people can live here. And, and one of the things I think is a project that's already beginning, but I want to highlight as something that should be a priority for us, is converting unused commercial space and repurposing it for other you know, important priorities, housing being the, the very top of that list. So I look at this budget, of course, or this, you know, the proposed budget, not only as an as a as a stark reality, and that we do have to provide high quality services for our residents, because frankly, that's what they deserve, and that's what we were elected to help, um, you know, facilitate as well. But also as a marker and a challenge, and one that we're going to live up to because we have to. Mm -hmm. Further comment, Ms. McMurray. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I want to just thank everybody who's taken part in the budget process thus far. I know you are halfway through your journey. Mr. Ellis, thank you. Um, I know this can be soul crushing, as I have been quoted in saying in past years. Um, I would like to change scrubbing to tidy up. I just think it sounds nicer if we can like make that catch on. I'd love that. Um, I think that's an easy and free request. Um, we are a growing and diverse city, and city like ours needs services, um, whether it be to keep us safe or keep us engaged or to educate our future. All neighbors rely on some kind of service in our city, which has been mentioned. We are also a very diverse city, which we all celebrate. Um, we have elderly people on fixed incomes. We have young people putting down roots. We have youth who want we want to thrive. We have high income. We have middle income. We have low income people, and we want to meet them all where they are and allow them to stay in Norwalk and thrive as long as they want. Um, everything has gone up in price, including housing. We have to pay more for materials, for energy, for resources and services that we didn't a few years ago. And that's not a Norwalk problem, that's a nationwide problem. Couple that with the fact that we had to go through our revaluation. This process is mandated and out of our hands, but affects us nonetheless. Unfortunately, is going to affect our citizens of the town negatively, including all of us. What we are faced with during this budget is ensuring that we keep taxes as low as possible, but we also continue to provide services for every citizen in the city. I have asked, as I have in the past, for different scenarios, which we were given tonight. Thank you again, Mr. Ellis. Um, and it is my opinion that we cannot continue to grow as a city and not grow our services along with that increase. 
We have several new initiatives coming down the pipeline in the next few years, including a South Norwalk school that we will need to staff, a new recreation center that we'll need to staff, to name a couple. We also have many new apartment buildings, which means more people. How can we keep them all safe without staffing our fire department accordingly? Switching to electric will also be a huge upfront cost, even if there's savings down the road. How do we handle the increase in traffic by foot, by bike, and by vehicle if we can't keep up with the projects around our roads and sidewalks? I honestly don't know how I feel about this budget at this moment in time, but I know I feel very troubled looking ahead to the future. How do we balance the increase in taxes and the services needed to a growing city? Mm. I task us all with the very monumental job of looking at any efficiencies there are in the city and coming up with a strategy that incorporates the needs of our growing city can we combine departments um, in IT or HR with NPS? Are there positions that will pay for themselves, such as the grant writer that others have mentioned or another blight officer? Mm -hmm. We need to go back to the efficiency study again and again until we strike the right balance. As my colleague, Ms. Ayers said, there are basic services that we cannot waver on. That should not be debated. That shouldn't be basic fundamental rights. We need to come up with a strategy that encompasses what our core values are we also need to think about growth in the city and how we can keep up with it if we are to continue to go down this path of growth. That's it. Yep. Further comments or discussion? Mr. Josie Egner. Um, Mr. Mayor, just because, I mean, you know, obviously the housing is, is the devastating part of this, right? I mean, as you know, Mr. Seed has said, as Mr. Wiggins has said, and others said, I mean, the number one question here is the impact this is going to be um, on housing. I wonder if you could if you have an update on the timeline for some of our affordable housing studies, I, I think that this revaluation is going to put even more pressure on us to sort of have a plan we can offer our residents as to how we're thinking about meeting some of the housing challenges that this, and so I just wondered if you had an update on the uh, timeline. I don't, I can give you that information sure. uh, tomorrow when I uh, contact uh, Steve. Uh, Steve Kleppen would be uh, on top of that and uh, Jessica Vonashek as well. Okay, thank I'll you. get that information. If you're listening, Steve or Jess, call in. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Steve Kleppen is out of the office until Monday, but Jess might. Be okay. Yeah, <laughs> because she's going to be. There you uh, go. Yeah. Any further comments or discussion? So then I shall call for a vote on this. So, Mr. Let, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, one, one comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so there is a resolution, mm -hmm. as I read. Um, by charter, the, the council has. Until uh, uh, March fifth, which would be next Tuesday, to um, um, vote on the operating budget cap, so that we can uh, move forward in the process and, and forward the operating budget cap to the Board of Estimate Taxation, so they can begin doing the line by line mm -hmm. review and discussion with the departments during the month of March which will culminate with the uh, BET holding a uh, public hearing on March 20th. Um, so I think in, in the spirit of that, um, uh, several questions have been answered today. We've received a lot of good information tonight, um, but there might be uh, a need for further discussion, dialogue, review of materials. Um, so I'll, I'll you, you are. Okay. So then, I, I so so. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. You are deferring because I think we had our conversation. So yes. So I did. We we are supposed to be deferring this. We are not making. So at this point, not to do Mr. this. Tonight. Mr. Mayor, we I I read the resolution. I would like to request that we table this item until uh, the specific date of Tuesday, March fifth, whereby a special meeting would be called by the council president um, for us to bring this item back to the table for further discussion and a vote. So I'm going to, go Mayor, oh, go, ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that a motion to table is not debatable. So we... We're all in favor, but I think the way we did it was a little different than what we discussed um, last evening. But yes, um, because I did have a few comments that I wanted to say, but it's not debatable. So we can go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, if you want to hold that off and give it, <laughs> would you like to, would you like to withdraw the motion? Withdraw for a moment. No, no so, we've already made, so we can just okay. go ahead. Go and forward. Do, all right. Go, move forward. Motion to table is not debatable. Uh, all in favor? 
Opposed? Abstentions? No Motion carries and we will bring this back to the council on March 5th, I, I believe. Yes, okay. thank you, Mr. Council. So what I wanted to say, because I thought that like, we had came to agreement that I, as president, was going to make that motion. What I wanted to say to residents and to everyone around this table, um, and I hope that residents see how committed we are um, to trying to get this right. We are at a point where this is critical, crucial to how the city will look and feel moving forward as all of our council members have expressed um, here. So I hope that residents know um, that we do not enter into this lightly and we are taking extra time to review the information once we receive it because as everyone has said, this will determine what the city looks like decades moving forward um, for the next few decades. And so we, we, we're not gonna get everything right, but there are some things that we need to take care of in order to continue to move this city forward. And I, 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 I echo what uh, uh, Ms. Nora uh, Nijelski Eichner has, Eichner has said, what um, Ms., um, uh, Nicole has said, and everyone around this table, we need IT and we need a grants writer. And a grants writer with the position within itself brings in money for the city. That is the goal. And so if we can support a position like that, if it's not now, but sometime in the future, um, we really need to do those sorts of things. And as, as it was expressed, and as we've all experienced, IT is an issue. Um, we need more security. Whether it's physical in this building, it's IT, it's all of those things that we need to have done. So um, I'm gonna stop it there. I, I appreciate this opportunity. And I'm not sure if we've ever had this type of discussion open yet to this at this level. I don't know if you recall that any discussion like this about the budget. No, I think uh, I think everybody is asking the questions that need to be asked, yeah. making the statements that need to be made. And um, all those things need to be taken into consideration. And I'm sure the members of the public who may be listening or who will be coming to the public hearing uh, will appreciate all the hard work that has been done. So now it brings me to Ms. Shanahan. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have two ordinances that I'd like to bring to the council. And um, with your indulgence, I'd like to bring them out of order um, from the agenda because we have a paid consultant who's helping us with the um, reapportionment. And so okay. yep. in an effort to save money, I'd like to <laughs> not have him online any longer than we need to. Hourly pay? <laughs> yes, so thank you very much. So the first one I'm going to um, ask for, I think Mr. Mendick is with us. So we'd like to um, bring him up to a position of panelist and he's gonna help us go through this, but let me please first um, read the, um, the item. Approved new ordinance, establishing an advisory committee for the reapportionment of common council voting districts. And just to, um, I'd, I'd like to move that item and I'll move, it, move it to Mr. Mednick, but um, this is in response to the um, changes that we made in the charter in this past election. And so at this point, um, we have not re, drawn our common council districts in more, well, since in the 1960s, I'm pretty sure. So it's um, well past due that we um, look at this issue and I'd like to have Mr. Mendick, um, who is our expert, show up if, there, if you can bring them to the screen. Do you see, does somebody see him? Because yep, you him. have to scroll to see him. Yeah. Oh, I have to scroll. Okay, scroll, you'll see him. It's, it's the man with the very big white beard. There's <laughs> <laughs> my friend. Oh. There he is. And Jessica's listening too. Oh, there he is. I see you, Steve. Great. So, Steve, if you could um, give us um, a little bit of a summary of what we um, of the ordinance that we drafted together with our committee and um, how this sits, that would be really helpful. Well, I believe the the old uh, ordinance was. Uh, rather vague. Um, oh, no, no, Mr. Bruski, we're oh. speaking Steve Mendick. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, Madam President, members of the body. Um, it's nice to see everybody uh, on, on a rainy evening. In, in, uh, um, as uh, the chair pointed out, the ordinance is a result of the charter revision Modific the modific modification of the charter that requires a reapportionment to take place. It should have taken place three years ago. It should have taken place over the last 60 or 70 years. And, um, and instead of tackling the issue in the last revision, as you recall, the last revision was a pretty substantial rewrite of the charter. Um, the, the commission decided to uh, 
require an ordinance to be adopted by the Common Council to address the issue. And um, I will point out some of the things that we can cannot do and that hopefully will inform the 2025 charter revision process uh, to actually uh, constitutionalize the provision. Uh, but what we tried to do here is we, we tried to um, lay out the standards. The standards are constitutional standards. Uh, you just can't go out and create districts um, to accommodate your own political whims, your political interests, um, your own your own personal desires as members of the council. Ultimately, it's the council that will be approving uh, the charter revision. I think that gets lost in some of the debate. Uh, but uh, if you take a look at it um, in 9-26, it lays out the constitutional standards that apply uh, to the charter, the um, the reapportionment process. And, and what we did uh, when I drafted this and proposed it to the committee, um, I was trying to, and I've looked at all the, and I've drafted many of these around the state, um, many of the older provisions in the charter that people cite often um, have partisan leaders that make the appointments. Some of them make them on their own. Some of them make them with the support of a majority of their legislative body. Uh, but the standard is uh, you have a majority leader, minority leader, usually Democrats and Republicans. Um, New Haven, there are no Republicans. And Hartford, there are no Republicans, but there's a working families party. Um, and, and what I tried to do to the extent we could was to try to propose a scheme that was not overtly partisan. And it's one of the reasons I recommended that the president of the body be the appointing authority and for the first um, uh, advisory com committee. And remember, this is an advisory committee. They do not um, create the final districts. You will create the final districts upon their recommendation if all of this works as it should. And so the president gets to appoint the seven members, uh, no more than three of whom shall be of a of a uh, the same political party. Um, the president should and is required to consult with the majority and minority leaders of the council, and ultimately it's a majority vote of the council uh, that creates the committee. Um, one of the things that we lay out here is that in addition to the caucus leaders of the council, the president in putting this group together uh, should consult with civic, political, community leaders in order to find members uh, who um, reflect the diversity of the residents, as well as, and this is very important, the geographic representation required by the charter. One of the things we uh, did in the charter revision this past year, uh, aside from the other forms of diversity, race, gender, and uh, and uh, is geography, because in many cities we find that boards and commissions are there's mal there's mal representation, where you end up with people from one neighborhood to the exclusion of many others. And so the intent here was to have the president make this appointment. Once the committee is uh, created, they will go into the field. Um, and I won't get into all the details of this. They will be able to use data and resources. Uh, hopefully there would be funds that would be provided for them uh, to hire a consultant. There are consultants throughout the country that serve um, uh, at state level, local level to deal with redistricting. Um, and I know that uh, the Corporation Council's office has already begun to prepare an RFP to address this issue. That committee would be uh, in, engaged in the process of um, working with the consultant, meeting with members of the public, conducting public hearings uh, to uh, create a proposed map, proposed district map that would um, be proposed to the to the um, to the council. Uh, and again, the intent of this also, and members of the council were very um, in, uh, instructive and in, uh, influential in making this change was to try to keep as close to the district lines as we have uh, in the present time so that we don't have a uh, chaotic alterations or shift from where we are to where we need to be. But we need to do it within the constitutional standards that are required. Uh, 
when it goes to the uh, the the common council, the common council has um, to act within 45 days of the receipt of the report. They themselves would conduct a public hearing on the recommendations, reviewing the boundaries. They have the ability to modify the report. Again, their modifications, like the commission, the, the committee's recommendations, need to be done in accordance with um, the constitutional requirements that are laid out broadly in section 9-26. And then a majority of the body, uh, as defined by the charter, it's a majority of the members of the council present and voting, would approve, approve the new districts, and then the districts would go into effect. If the council is unable within that time frame to create the districts, the mayor then gets to appoint a second advisory committee. Again, advisory committee, they don't make decisions. Uh, the way this was set up is that you need to adopt an ordinance. The only body that can adopt an ordinance is the council. Uh, and that, that committee would be comprised of three people. Um, each member would be uh, of a different political a party affiliation or no party affiliation, uh, so that no political party shall attain uh, a, a majority of um, the members of this group. Uh, so the um, so the the intent obviously was to shift it away from partisan appointments and to move it to kind of a broader sense of appointment. One of the things that you find as you go around the cities in Connecticut is very rarely are unaffiliated voters represented in these entities because people are appointing um, political people to accommodate uh, the two major parties uh, from, from city to city. That that group then has to uh, make their recommendations and it goes back to the uh, council for final action, uh, which has to occur within one week of the filing with the uh, town clerk. And it's again, a majority vote standard. What's missing in this ordinance that we cannot put into the ordinance at this time, so this is going to really rely on the good faith of this council, because it will be this council that addresses the issue, is we don't have a fail safe in this provision. We're not able to do that because the standard for adoption was by ordinance. When the next commission um, is formed, we'll see how this operates. The, you, this. Um, this will be in the field. This will be operational. The new districts will be in place uh, while the next Charter Revision Commission is considering additional modifications of the Charter, and this would be one of the items that could come before them. And at that time, if this system works and everybody likes it, it might be a very easy uh, transition to just move it into the Charter. Um, if there's uh, problems getting the uh, document through the char uh, the council, you you arrive at some kind of stalemate during this process, uh, they might consider putting a, a fail-safe provision in there. In a number of my charters, if the council cannot act, then the final action of the advisory committee becomes the um, the district system. Uh, and so it, it's a, it, it would be a charter authority that would allow for the creation in the event the council is unable to create it. We couldn't do that in this ordinance uh, because we uh, stand, the, the commission created a standard where the ordinance was the vehicle for creating the entity. Um, so that's it for, fairly broadly. I know that there are a number of questions that people have raised um, about it on a partisan level, but uh, I wanted to explain a little bit of the thinking that went into the creation and the structure of the entity. So I have Thank you so much, Steve. That's so, that so helpful. Um, one other thing I wanted to um to point out, I'm not sure if you said this at the outset. The committee that's a, originally appointed by the president um, can only have three members of any of the different parties. So there can never be a majority rule. There would be a majority. Yeah. I, yep. So I wanted to um open it up to questions to the council if anybody has any. I'll answer your question. <laughs> Mr. Joseph Eichner. Just super briefly, um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you to the whole committee for this. We went back and forth quite a lot. I want to reemphasize the point that Lisa just made, Steve made. Um, no, no party has more than three. Um, and to Steve's point, part of why we did that is because in Norwalk, our unaffiliated are a substantial portion of our registration base. And so 
This structure allows us to make sure that we have unaffiliated members, we have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have independents. We actually can get the full diversity of our city as opposed to a bipartisan model, which excludes actually a very large percentage of our city's um, registered voters. Um, and I also just wanted to reemphasize the point that Steve also mentioned, but I didn't want it to get lost. Um, this ordinance specifically calls for the committee to keep historical lines to the extent that they are constitutional. It calls for us to keep the taxing districts within the um, districts to the extent possible. So all of this is, entined, and is intended to allow only the small necessary changes to get us constitutionally aligned. There's there's no intent here. And I think it's important for the legislative record. The intent here is really to make the smallest possible changes. Um, and they get rid of silly things like one street in a neighborhood not being in, <laughs> in the same district as the rest, you know, all those kinds of factors. But it really is intended to make small changes and merely get us into constitutional alignment. So thank you. Thank you. Further comments or discussion? Ms. Dunn. You know, it's got to be me. Um, I understand and I respect what you're saying, but I wholeheartedly disagree. I think this is not the best thing for Norwalk. Um, I think it leaves the door open for corruption. I Having one person take total control over appointing people, whether in consulting, consulting anybody else or not, um, I don't think it's the best thing for Norwalk go, going forward, and I'm not going to um, be in favor of it. For the discussion, Ms. Smith. I would just like to point out that this is common practice uh, for setting um, any type of commission or, um, you know, is that the council president does make these appointments uh, in conjunction with majority leader, minority leader, uh, discussing with the mayor's office. So this this has been common practice. For, uh, Ms. M uh, Ms. Murray. <laughs> That's okay, Mayor. Um, I, I just want to say that we I did do and and the count our committee did a lot of research into practicing in other cities. It's been brought up and we've heard in discussion um, from our opposition that uh, Stanford does it this way or Stratford does it this way. We've seen letters from the public that say, uh, I think they said Stanford, Bridgeport, uh, and I can't remember the other city were the gold standard. Well, we, we know that's not true also in discussion. We've also heard, well, there's so many problems in the way Stanford does it. We did a lot of research into our particular structure. We have a hybrid structure. 15 members seems like a good fit for the amount of districts we have. To go into Stanford where you have 40 uh, council members, there's no accountability. It's hard for the voter to keep up with that. So we did a lot of looking into uh, whatever was presented to us, we researched to see if it was viable here. Um, and I think we did a great job of being open to those ideas. Uh, we looked at organizations um, like Common Cause, which was started by a Republican and set out sort of the best practices for redistricting. And I feel that we incorporated all of that information um, and looked over it, no stone unturned. So I'm really proud of what we did. And uh, I think we've come to something really fair and equitable for everyone. Mr. Wiggins. So there'll be, it, it can't be more than three per, per party. Um, unless they're all unaffiliated. Unless they're all unaffiliated. Uh, okay, go ahead, Mr. Wiggins. So it can't be three or um, more than three, but it's appointed by the uh, the, the, the chair and the uh, majority leader. No, by the president. Yes, by the president of council um, in consultation with, with the majority leader and the minority leader and also civic leaders. Um, specifically, they're charged to speak to civic leaders and other members of the community. But Councilman again, I think that's a really good point um, because uh, Councilmember Dunn said, well, it's not fair for just one person to do the appointing. And that's not exactly accurate. What happens is she does it in consultation with the rest of the council. Uh, and so... Uh, and then it, it goes to vote. So of all the councils, so you know, she puts she puts forward uh, the people we're going to be looking at. They can't be of all a majority of one party, and they have to be civic leaders and community members. So even if they are all unaffiliated, uh, you know, that's those are the interested parties that reflect the diversity that's in our language of our city. Um, uh, but they can't be because they need to be a 
a mix, no majority. So it, it can't be just one person. Yes, she's putting them forward, but this is a system that's multi-tiered and reliant on many people. Uh, and so I think that's why it's fair. And it does come before council to be voted on the committee itself. Mr. Wiggins, any further questions? You still have the floor. Yeah, just just a thought. So just last question. So she, uh, she's the um, minority leader. So would she be able to pick um, people or suggest people? Suggest okay. people. Yeah. And then it ultimately comes back to the council. Pardon me. Ms. Smith. I, I would also like to add that we have all been asked right, to make recommendation. I have personally recommended to Republicans. So <laughs> just wanted to look that up. It's done. I, I guess it, it's not really about me. And obviously I haven't been part of a political party, so it's not really for me, the partisanship, but I, I do find that the people that are put forward are, you know, the insider baseball, people that are acceptable to people, not the people that make waves or might ask hard questions that people aren't happy with um, for me. And again, it's, I keep saying it's not about the people here right now because I do have a lot of trust for these people, but it's an ordinance that has been for a very long time. And I really feel that going forward, as difficult as it is to change an ordinance, and it would require somebody wanting to change something. And, and when you're in a position of comfort, you don't necessarily want to change something. So my, my thing is that how do we make sure that we have different perspectives coming to the table with different opinions that aren't, we aren't necessarily comfortable with? And, and that's not necessarily me. So it's not really about me. And that's why I'm uncomfortable with it because there are people that don't think like me that I, I think need to be heard. Further questions or comments? This, I, I just want to say I, I actually agree. I thought that, that was a fair question, but I, I do believe our process is the best we have. I but, disagree. That's okay. But I think it's a, a fair question that can be brought up while we do our voting, for sure, to look at the pool of people. Further comment or discussion? So before you close out, Mayor, I, I have to say, I think, um, you know, this is this will be new to me, but we have received names um, potential candidates from folks. And, and I would request that you send more. I know uh, Ms. Ayers has sent uh, some names and Ms. Smith has and, and Nora has as well. And Ms. McMurr. And Ms. McMurr, yes. And so uh, we have a list. I don't think we're looking at just seven people. We want a list of folks to, to choose from so that it, I get it. So for me, it's not about you specifically. No, I know. It's about an ordinance and how hard it is to change that going forward. And for me, honestly, it's about looking what's going on nationally. And I don't want to get into like Supreme Court stuff and all that kind of stuff. But it's concerning me when people have the power to redistrict the way they want. And I know Mr. Bendick says there's laws about it, but you pay attention to what's going on, especially down south. It's really scary to me. So that's where I'm coming from. I want to have fail safes in there. Understood. Further comment or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? So Ms. Dunn is opposed, Mr. Wiggins abstains, and the other uh, uh, 13 in favor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mednick. We appreciate you staying. Right. Ms. Uh, Shanahan, you're still, you're still up to date. So our last um, matter is to approve revisions to Chapter 58A, which is flight prevention. And um, mm -hmm. the opportunity came to us that um, the state allowed us to change the penalties for the flight. And so we could increase the penalties for um, violations. So we decided that if we were going to look at the violation statute, we should uh, the violation section of the statute, that we ought to also look at the definitions. So we spent a lot of time with um, Mr. Bruski. Jess Bonacek, um, Bill Ireland, and worked really through a new definition of the um, blighted property, and then also how to make um, how to go forward on the property violations itself. And um, if we have Steve here and Jess, I thought I'd turn it over to them to um, have them go through this discussion in a little bit more detail. There's Jess this year. Ms. Bonacek, 
and she's muted. <laughs> there she is. Gosh, after all that prep time, I still couldn't I get know. the mute button right. Um, good evening, everyone. So um, we've been working with the ordinance committee uh, over the last several months to be able to make updates to the blight ordinance. And um, actually, not only did we do that to address some of the state statute changes that came in place, and I will mention that um, that Corporation Council was very involved in updating the state statute for blight, but also we were asked through um, Senator Duff's office to help out as well. And so we were really grateful to be able to do that based on our experience here with Bill Ireland and, and Stephen Bruski and their experiences. And so there were a number of changes that came through the state statute. And the primary one that actually drove a lot of the change was talking about the um, fees and the fines that are associated to blight and specifically daily fines. And so um, what you'll see with the proposed blight ordinance that's in front of you today, there are really a couple of major changes from the existing blight ordinance that we have here in the city of Norwalk. The first is that we worked really hard um, to be able to define blight differently. And if you were to look at the original blight ordinance, you would see that it really is only a page and a half or a couple of pages. And so um, the team worked hard with Lisa and Tom to be able to define blight a little bit differently, looking at not only blight and teasing that out, but also looking at property maintenance and being able to include more specifics there. And that's really important because it allows us the opportunity to be able to enforce differently and enforce in more of a progressive way that helps us define what blight is and what it's not. Um, before, when we had more of a vague definition of blight, we weren't able to necessarily um, be as progressive in the sense of having those parameters of what is in the ordinance and what's not. Um, the second is the addition of the word commercial. So uh, the state statute actually didn't include the word commercial, it only included residential. And you'll see with the original blight ordinance that a lot of the language around blight definition focused mm -hmm. specifically about around residential. And so now with the addition of commercial, uh, we have the ability to uh, work with folks in different neighborhoods addressing different businesses um, and being able to focus on that specifically. The third is the fine definition. Originally, we were only um, able to fine $100 a day. And the new state statute actually allows us a different uh, fine schedule or a different ability to fine. Um, the first is $150 for an occupied property per day. The second is uh, $250 per day for an, a vacant property, which is really important because we actually see the majority of our blighted properties are owned by um, banks or third party companies where the home has gone into foreclosure and the bank is sitting on the property and it's actually vacant, which is why the yard is growing or the fence is falling down. It's just unkept. So it's a really big, um, that's a really big element for us. And then the third piece in there is um, is having if there's a if there the property is blighted three times in the year, then we have the ability to find a thousand dollars. So if it's a chronic person, it's a if it's a chronic blight issue, and it has a blight violation and that's corrected, and then another blight violation corrected, if it has the third blight violation, we're able to find a thousand dollars in addition to the 250 or the 150 per day. So, you know, there's a big difference between what the existing ordinance looks like and what the proposed ordinance looks like. I will have to say that, um, you know, we always have work to do. We've been ramping up with the neighborhood improvement team. We've been ramping up with the enforcement and how complaints come in through city hall. Um, we've been working on different approaches to be able to work with um, community members to understand what problem properties are out there. Um, I think, you know, as of a couple of months ago, um, starting in September, we actually bring together all of the different departments that do permitting and licensing. And we run through all of those properties that have compliance issues across different departments so that we can run through with the legal department on what progress is being made and what areas we have to be able to um, talk with them on. 
And so we've been doing a number of different initiatives um, in addition to the blight ordinance itself. But, you know, I think that we should be really proud of being able to, to make change to the ordinance and also the fact that the state statute reflects what we've seen here in Norwalk. Um, I know Brian Candela has done a lot of research uh, through the ordinance committee on what other communities are doing, how they're identifying um, blight citations, blight violations, how they're documenting that. And we've been talking about a standard operating procedure in, in order to be able to not only identify, but track. Um, I have heard some comments on, you know, are we blighting um, a little too extensively? Is that actually a blight violation or is it something that, um, that maybe not, but I think that extended blight uh, definition will really help in being able to have Steve Bruski do his work. Um, and so, you know, I'll leave it there and answer any questions that you may have, but um, Lisa, if there's anything I've left out, please let me know. No, thank you so much, Jess. This has been a real um, problem in our um, districts. I think all of us have had um, different complaints from different um, aspects of our uh, neighborhood. And so it's really important that we address this and we um, beef up our ability to address these concerns. So I'll open up the floor if there's um, other questions. Questions, comments? So I have a comment um, and I shared it um, in, at our caucus meeting. And, and first I have to say kudos to to your committee and, and, and to the city and to all the departments for getting this done. It's long overdue. And I'm hoping that the impact will be meaningful uh, for communities. But my concern is the definition of light for commercial property as it pertains to contractors. And as you said, each community or district has their own type of light. And South Norwalk, unfortunately, um, has had the worst type of light because we have properties that have that can have residential homes on them be converted into contractor. So you will have a home and a contractor. Um, but the definition that I see in this ordinance pertains to boarded up buildings. You might not have that condition at a contractor yard because they don't have those types of structures. Um, so I'm concerned about that because I think as we move forward with this, rather than take a wait and see approach with what we're doing, let's get this right and tackle this at every angle so that when we do start this process, we, we have a real process that attacks everything at the same time. Um, and so I, I, I talked with, um, I shared that at the council, I actually had a conversation um, with Ms. Vonashek about it. Um, and so there were some concerns and I know the law department has weighed in on it as well. Um, but I think there's more to do, but I think this is a great start. The fines hopefully will make some sort of impact as well on, um, on the city. Um, but I, those are the concerns that I have and that I'd like to see that be addressed um, as we move forward with this and do this in a time to make. Yep. Um, but I am in support of it, but I do want to see those things happen. And we have committed to work with legal department and also with Mr. Kleppen, who um, is out of town this week to talk about the differences between uses of land right. and light, right. um, light land. Right. So, And where we'll those continue. descriptors lie and who can enforce them. Right, exactly. Okay. And tighten, the, tighten up right. the restrictions on that. And Mario, I don't know if you want to say anything about that in specific or anything. Other than what you said earlier, you know, in our... Yeah, you know, what I said earlier is that uh, 10 years ago, the city had no blight ordinance, the city had no zoning enforcement ordinance, and those are two um, are two areas that the mayor thought were a priority for the city to to address. And within the first two few years of, of him being mayor, me being the core council, we did get a past both the blight ordinance and zoning enforcement ordinance. And what I alluded to earlier today in some of our emails was that um, the process isn't, isn't perfect yet, but it's getting pretty close. And compared to where the city was, and where it, where you know all, all the great things that have been done in, in the areas of uh, enforcement, both in blight and zoning enforcement. From my perspective, having seen it where we had nothing to where we are now is is really impressive. And I commend those who want to keep pushing, keep pushing to make sure you get it right. Um, and I also just point out, aside from the uh, enforcement part of it, there is um, a lot of there's opportunities to work with people to give people an opportunity to work with the city. Where they have good cause, they're trying to remediate the blight. The, the, the intent is not to raise money. The intent is to remediate the violation. And I'll just tell you that from my experience, um, that is the way the city does administer it. Very, you know, I think compassionate with folks about 
um, working with people, and there is a, a, a blight uh, hearing officer in the zone enforcement hearing officer who hear appeals when people do uh, have reason to uh, pass the fines. Great, thank you. Uh, further comments, questions? Ms. Lewandowski Eichner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And I just wanted to thank you, Mario, for bringing up that point with something I did want to raise. There is actually a specific section in this ordinance about our obligations to work with folks who are elderly, who are low income. And I think that's an important thing. We just want to highlight this is very much on the minds of everyone doing this ordinance is that balance again. How do we protect our city? How do we support people? Um, uh, and I, I also want to um, you know, agree with um, Council Member Young. You know, I think there's a, as we are moving into doing commercial, it does, there is, a, there is a gap when you read this, it is very clear that sort of we have in mind residential, the visual is a residential property. And I think it will be important to think about as we evolve because the commercial owners are going to need guidance as well. This is a new for them. What are the standards? What is the expectation? So I'm, I'm really grateful, um, uh, Council Member Shanahan for the work on this um, going forward. The other thing I do wanna um, just add again, that we've received public comment primarily right at the end of the process. So. Um, Council Corporation Council mentions the citation hearing officer. We did receive some feedback about that from public comment at the end of our process. And I think I just want to acknowledge that that is comment we received, something that I think we may revisit as well as we continue to revisit the ordinance. You know, does the council have a role in um, appointing that individual or confirming that individual? Are there options um, for expectations for how that those hearing officer conducts business that need to be incorporated into this ordinance? So I think these are all questions that people brought up that we will continue to work on. And I just want to acknowledge that. We are always yeah. looking to recruit attorneys who want to volunteer their time <laughs> as blight or zoning uh, enforcement officers or hearing officers. And, and quite often I'm asked to try to recruit folks. Um, so, you know, you brought up eligibility. If you know folks who are interested, please send them to me. Uh, we certainly are always looking for uh, uh, attorneys who are willing to volunteer their time for the city in those positions. Any further comments or discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Extensions. Motion carries unanimously. We need one more motion. Motion to adjourn. Not in use. All in favor? <laughs> oh, I want to stay. We are adjourned at 941. Thanks, everyone. Retro, you I don't, I don't, however, you have to get off. Oh.